I work with my own business, well, I research right now, formally, I work with you, with that, and I work with Richard, as a Google brother. So, I've been around strawberries a little while, uh, long enough to have made a number of mistakes, and I hope that uh, I'll be able to share some of that with you and <coughs> let you guys benefit from it, so you can go on and make your own mistakes and not make mine. Um, Tom Bauman did a great job of uh, looking at the big picture of growing plastic culture strawberries. So I guess what I'll do is I'll look more in the narrow sense about, well, what do tunnels do or not do for you? And um, what about bedding? You know, what do you need to know when you're making beds for um, a plastic culture? So the first thing you need to know about tunnels is, you know, what kind of changes do they make in the environment? And Probably the most dramatic one, the one you first notice, is when you walk in there in the middle of the day, the daytime temperatures are higher, of course, right? Greenhouse effect and all that. You'd think that the nighttime temperatures are higher too, but unless you have a really tightly sealed tunnel where the ends are very well sealed, unlike the one in the picture, the nighttime temperatures are not higher. So, you know, they won't be um, a substitute for frost protection. Um, you know, if it freezes outside, it's probably going to freeze inside as well. Um, the second difference that they make, and this is probably the most dramatic one as far as strawberry quality goes, is they decrease the leaf wetness times. You know, all those dews, all those rainfalls, they don't happen in the tunnel. There's very, very little leaf wetness in in the tunnel, which means that your foliar disease is much less inside than outside. Um, more importantly, it means your fruit disease, you know, the tritis, the rhizopus, all those fungal diseases that rely on uh, leaf wetness really don't do nearly as well inside a tunnel as they do outside the tunnel. Um, I didn't put it up here though, but as, as you would guess, by decreasing leaf wetness and by increasing the daytime high temperatures, the humidity is lower, right? And that means that sometimes things like powdery mildew that usually isn't a problem outside the tunnel can become a problem inside the tunnel. So if you don't grow, if you grow a variety that's really susceptible to powdery mildew, it's, you're really going to see it in the tunnel. Fortunately, algae and the seascape are not particularly susceptible to power. Tunnels reduce the wind, um, obviously. They also increase the soil temperature. You're getting a bit of boost in soil temperature by using a mulch, uh, mulch bed, especially if you're using black plastic. But you also get a boost in soil temperature from using the tunnel because those daytime temperatures are higher. And as you go through the season, that tends to accumulate. So in the tunnel, that increased soil temperature will often mean that you'll start harvesting a little bit sooner in an open-end tunnel like this for us in Washington. It's not a huge difference, but you might start five to seven days earlier. Um, and it means that um, the gap you know, it starts earlier. If you've grown day neutrals before, you know that many of them have a gap between the June season and the later season, right? So when you're in a tunnel, that whole cycle shifts forward a little bit, maybe five days, maybe seven days. So the stuff in the tunnel starts to gap sooner. It drops off before the material outside. And then the second season starts a little bit sooner, too. Yeah. So some of these things I've already talked about. There's reduced botrytis. The biggest thing really, really is a longer shelf life. There's less botrytis, there's less of the other fungal diseases, and what that means is that when you harvest product, it stays looking good on the shelf a lot longer than open field material usually does. For us in Washington, you know, sometimes we'll have a really, really rainy June. So the June fruit, you can see a huge difference in the quality in the outside fruit and the tunnel fruit. Because the outside fruit has been rained on a bunch, it's soggy, and it's a very short shelf life. Nobody wants to handle it. Um, but the tunnel material is much better quality. That difference is a lot less in 
say August and September, when even up north we reliably have pretty good weather, and you have really good weather down here. So you, you won't see that difference as much in the latter part of the big neutral season, but you sure see it early on. So this is all the wonderful things on this side. This side's all the, the awful things about tunnels, right? In, in my experience with tunnels, um, we grew on a spot that started out having a really <coughs> moderate verticillium pressure. Um, and through three years of growing mm -hmm. lettuce and strawberries on the tunnels, we managed to inflame that into a raging verticillium problem. Um, and it was worse in the tunnels than it was outside, perhaps because that soil temperature is a little warmer. <coughs> Verticillium really likes warm temperatures. So if you're going onto ground um, in which you have any cause to suspect verticillium, if you're going on ground that you know has vert from another crop, if you're going on the ground and you're following potatoes or tomatoes or any other solanaceous crop, um, you should be aware that Having tunnels is probably going to exacerbate your verticillium problem. Um, I haven't seen it so much in Washington. We don't tend to have bad mite problems on our strawberries, but certainly in many places people do. They're often exacerbated in the tunnels. Um, it's drier in the tunnels. The mites really like that. They do well with it. Um, and then also, as I mentioned, there's more powdery milk. But for us, when we were growing um, our, our uh, strawberries in Washington, we found that we could manage these. We could manage verticillium by choosing our rotations carefully. We could manage mites pretty easily with either chemical or biologicals. We could manage powdery mildew pretty easily by picking the right varieties. Um, the reduced botrytis was difficult for us to manage without a really uh, strong chemical program. So the tunnels had a real advantage for us for reducing the botrytis and for longer shelf life. So I think that's the, the take home on that for us. Um, this is just to show you the difference. It's, for us, it was a really moderate difference. This light colored, uh, excuse me, this light colored line. Is, um, is, in a, is productivity in a tunnel. This is going June through October. Uh, the dark colored line is Albion in an open field. And so you can see they both have an initial flowering and fruiting. There's the gap, which is offset. And then they both start up here for the major harvest season, August and September. And again, the tunnel is a little bit earlier, not a lot, five to seven days earlier. And it goes a tiny little bit longer at the end of the season. I think I'll skip over the disease ratings. We already talked about these, these particular things just to let you know. You know the, the disease is much less in a tunnel. The, the gray mold, the detritus, is much less in the tunnel than it was outside. But the verticillium was worse. This was from an early year, 2010. That verticillium just kept getting worse and worse as we, uh, as we went on. So there's a lot of different types of tunnels, many, many different styles. But I guess you could lump them into two groups. You could lump them into three season tunnels and four season tunnels. Okay, three season tunnels, plus like these, are typically um, they're temporary structures. Uh, many people will bend the, um, the metal for them on site. Um, you often see them ganged up one against the other, you know, so you can cover acres and acres with uh, joined three season tunnels. They're much less expensive than, uh, than four season tunnels. You can cover an acre with maybe about $12,000. Um, but they are not nearly as durable as four season tunnels. And here's an example. Right? This, is a, this was a late windstorm that we had in the Skagit Valley. It was a May windstorm, which is unusual for us. So we thought we were being smart. 
we had we kept our plastic down on our three season tunnels until um, mid April. We figured, okay, we're pretty much done with the gales. We put our plastic up, and uh, we got hit early in May with this windstorm that came from the west, it hit the tunnel broadside rather than on end. And you know, we lost this tunnel. You can see not only is the plastic in tough shape, but the metal structure itself is bent. <laughs> Um, on the other hand, four season tunnels are usually, as you can see, it's a lot more elaborate structure. These are much more expensive in general. Um, almost always they'll have closed ends like these. So you can close them up. In a tunnel like this, you really can expand your season much more than you can with a three season tunnel because you can keep them warmer at night. So you can expand into an earlier market uh, in the spring. Um, that brings other issues. You know, when you have a, a <coughs> contained space like that, you have to manage humidity as well. Also brings issue of managing equipment. With three season tunnels, you know, we were able to just use our field tractors, use our field equipment to lay beds, to <coughs> cultivate, to do what we needed to do just drive in and out of the open ends. You can't do that with this kind of tunnel. So you need specialized equipment, um, usually more like greenhouse equipment. Um, but they sure are durable. Uh, we worked with a guy in Lubbock, Texas, who grew uh, strawberries actually very successfully in four season tunnels there. And you know we thought it was a big deal when we got a windstorm that had peak winds of 50 miles an hour. Wow, that's pretty bad. Well, these guys would have days and days where it's 50 mile an hour winds. And they'll have, you know, months go by when, when peak winds are always above 20 miles an hour during the middle of the day. So they have wind to contend with all the time. And in an environment like that, you know, they use four season tunnels. And the guy's a pretty good photographer, I gotta say. Um, but you can see this was after several days of 50 mile an hour winds. The skin was ripped off of the tunnel, but the tunnel is intact. There was essentially no structural damage to that tunnel. So that's, that's the two basic families of tunnel. You, know, kind of, you get what you pay for. Um, if you use a tunnel, if you choose to use a tunnel, your big benefit is probably going to be better shelf length. Um, on bed shapers, that was the second thing I was asked to talk about. Uh, you know, you can grow plastic culture strawberries without having a dedicated bed shaper. You can just use your rotor tiller, you can make up you know, a nice fine seed bed like texture, and then you can take some discs and you can heap up beds in your field. And you can make that work. You can lay mulch over that and you can tuck it in so the wind doesn't blow it away. And you can make it work. You can get strawberries to work. But if you are going to grow plastic culture strawberries to any extent, if you're going to stay with it, I would encourage you to invest in a bed sheet. And there's a couple reasons for that. Um, one is that a well-formed bed with a dark plastic on it heats up sooner in the spring than a bare ground. It also heats up better than sort of a casually made bed. And here's the reason for that. If you look at, say, these two examples, right? Here's a, here's a bed shaper. It doesn't have a plastic on it yet. But you see how smooth the surface of the beds are, right? There's not a lot of air pockets. So if you just come through and you heap up beds with your discs, they're not going to be that smooth. And you might say, well, well, why does that matter? Well, the reason that it matters is that when you put the plastic on, if you've got a smooth surface, the soil is always in contact with that plastic. And you know, soil conducts heat pretty well. So when the plastic heats up, the soil conducts the heat away from the plastic and the soil warms up well. On the other hand, you know, if you've got just sort of a casually made bed that's sort of lumpy, well, those lumps all make air pockets in between the plastic and the bed. And so now, that air, those air pockets are great insulators. When the plastic heats up, the heat bumps up against the insulators, and the soil doesn't heat up as well. So a well-formed bed 
heats up better than a casually made bed does. The other thing that Tom, Tom Bauman had alluded to is that you don't have, you know, the plastic on there tight, have a well-formed bed. Um, you can get rain puzzles that accumulate on the plastic. And of course the strawberries are miraculous at finding the rain puddles and trying to grow in the rain puddles. You know, and believe me, it's not a happy bed. You don't want to see that. So with the bed shaper, what you get is your plastic is there, it's on there tight. There's usually a bit of crown. You can see on the example there that that shaper has a bit of a crown to it. And so the rain just rolls off. And you don't have places for the fruits to sit and accumulate water. About five minutes? Okay, thanks. Um, the two sort of families of bed shapers are adjustable and fixed. And, um, you know, if you are a, a, a mixed vegetable grower, if you also grow, say, like pumpkins, and squash, tomatoes, things like that, you might like an adjustable bed shape because you can, you can control the height, you can control the width. Um, they, they're great for that. They're very flexible. You can use them for your other crops as well. But they have disadvantages too. The beds really only go up to about 8 inches high. It's not quite high enough for the best kind of strawberry beds. Um, the other disadvantage with a lot of these, like the one in the picture here, is that the sweeps are kind of wide. And it's difficult to get the beds really close together. And so you wind up wasting space. Like the closest we could put our beds together with this adjustable shaper, we could get them maybe five, six feet apart at the very closest. Um, but it was tough to do. So we always wound up with more alleyway than we would like to have between the strawberry rows. Why not wasting space? Um, the alternative to that would be something like this, a fixed bed shaper. This particular one is made by a company called Kenko, and you can buy them that'll make one bed or two beds or three beds wide. It all depends on the horsepower that you have and what you want to spend. But one thing that you'll notice is that the alleyways, you know, they're really just wide enough to walk in, which is what you want. It's, you're using your space efficiently. The sides on these beds are very, very steep, so they, they present well to the sun. In the, uh, as the sun's rising and setting, they warm up more quickly, and they're higher. You can get them 12 inches or more. Um, the downside of these is that they make the, you know, the, they make the perfect strawberry bed. Those beds are not all that great for other things. For other things, you don't really need the steep sides don't really need the narrow alleyways. Um, they're not quite the right thing. So if, if you're using a better just for strawberries, I'd recommend this. If you want to use it for other things as well, I'd recommend the other type. I must be getting close on time, so uh, if there's any questions, any comments that people want to make, because there's a lot of people in here that have more experience with betters and tunnels than I do. And Tom Bowman, if you want to come back up and we can uh, address questions for both of you. How many years are you getting out of the tunnel for your strawberries? Well, um, we would get about three years out of the plastic skin. And I'm talking about the soil. How long can you be in that spot with strawberries in there before you have disease and oh. you can't plant back into it with strawberries? I would, I, would, um, I would move it every cycle. Unless you were fumigating, I would move every cycle. You must fumigate between the cycles. You know, on our site, you would have to because of the very simple. Yeah. Um, and I would imagine you have one of the very down here in the valley as well. Here and there. Yeah. Question over here. Over right here. Right, it's for you. Oh, oh, just a comment. Um, I agree with you about your observations about minimum night temperatures in those open end tunnels. I think we're getting some frost protection because of the reduction in radiation cooling on the leaf surface. You do? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm just, just from experience, uh, 
was in uh, central Mexico, in high elevation, yeah. where we're not getting frost injury on blossoms at temperatures that we would in the outside. Okay. Uh, and it might be three or four degrees. It's not a lot, but there might be something yeah, going three or four on. degrees. Well, it's been a long time since that's sorry. That's all you did. Yeah, I mean, I'm just going by observation. I don't have any science behind it. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess. I, I don't. When when we looked at our temperatures in our open ended tunnels, you know, we couldn't we couldn't find any difference in nighttime I on mean. those. But maybe there is some kind of protection that you get by not having the yeah. on there. Yeah, it seems like there's something going on. You, you you do. I agree with you, Tom, and I agree with you, Tom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, I agree with you because in, when we have corn production. Uh, the sweet corn production, we also put that, um, you know, the perforated plastic on top of it, and that has the same effect. It stops uh, at least, if, if it goes down to minus one in Celsius or 30, let's say, in Fahrenheit, um, it can stop that. But if we're going down to uh, 25 or something like that in your scale, uh, you scoop no matter what. Yeah, I agree with yeah. that. Yeah, a little, a little bit of protection, I agree with that. Yeah. A little bit. Does the length of the tunnel make any difference? So does, does the length of the tunnel make any difference? Well, the biggest difference that I could think of is if, if you're harvesting them, you know, how far do you have to walk them out of, the, out of the end of the tunnel? So I think a lot of the tunnels are limited to maybe 200 feet or so for just that practical harvest reason. Um, I can't think of any you know, major reason that the length would be a difference for a three season tunnel because they're often vented from the sides anyway. I mean, you go through the vent along the side anyhow. Uh, for four season tunnel, right? oh, Richard? In the summer, when it gets hot and heat can build up, we find a little bit shorter, well, around 200, 200 foot long because you have it side by side and you have a, a, a few acres together. Oh, yeah. The heat will build up in the center there. In the center of the row, so we've had 300 foot length, and I think 200. If, but, but then you have shorter rows, a lot more end pieces to your tunnels, so it's a little bit more expensive. You know, plus, making lanes if you have multiple uh, sections in the field. Yeah. yeah. I, I just can ask you, Richard, Richard, do you think down here being a little bit warmer than where we're <coughs> better to stay with a shorter Yeah, length. or some type of venting, you know, in the centers there for pushing up the sides. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's an issue. You know, the monitoring is key in there is <coughs> mid-summer um, management issue. I, I've seen in Central Mexico where they cut or left a blank spot in the middle of the 300 foot. And then they might have another piece that's higher up over that. Yeah. But it acts like a chimney. You know, it helps draw the air from both ends. Another way uh, on that is to use different colored plastics uh, and use some of the uh, light dispersing plastic. I've had really good results with that, where the light's coming from all sorts of different directions. And uh, we actually get more light into the canopy. That way, without the heating effect with the ultraviolet cover. So, there, there are some more options if you want to get really sophisticated. But this is not the point of today's session, I think, to get that technique. I guess there's ways. Yeah. There are ways. I've had a couple of growers ask me about alternatives to the black plastic. Have either of you had any experiences with the biomulches? Well, the bioplastic mulches? Not directly, but Carol Miles has done some work. Uh, yeah, and vegetables. Right? And I think well, she's done some good work on, on the degradability, evaluated a number of different films for the degradability. So the, the issue with those films is that you, know, you want them to be, to be broken down at the, at the end of the year and you want to be able to incorporate them and not be chunks. But with strawberries, it's a little bit more, a little bit different than vegetables in that you, you need them, them to stay good and intact for a little bit longer time. 
be, extre be extremely careful with that. Uh, I wouldn't suggest it. Uh, and while we're talking about incorporating, please don't ever uh, incorporate the plastic mulch into the soft. You know, I, I would say that you know, talk, if people are interested, they should talk to Carol because there are some newer products. And, and I agree entirely. The old products that were out, they said they were degradable. They were not. And there are, you know, there are cars years, around the country that are that are forever polluted with yeah. chunks of plastic. Yeah. So, but there are some newer products that, if I remember right, Carol had seen some positive results with. But I'd be also a little skeptical about, well, will they last long enough for a full stronger recycle? And in the hotter regions, let's say in California or in Florida, people are using uh, the clear plastic. The clear plastic gives you some solarization of the soil underneath while the plants are not big enough. Uh, what I found, if I establish the canopy of the plants on the black plastic fast enough, there's enough shading that when it does get hot, uh, the shade provides enough um, heat prevention so we don't get that overheating. If you're late in planting, uh, come late May in our regions, uh, we usually get a week of uh, hot. Uh, you're going to see the first leaves to shrivel up, and it's really bad in the summer if the canopy isn't filled. Uh, we can't do clear plastic in our regions because all we're going to do there is provide a wonderful tunnel for weeds to grow in. Yeah, I agree. That's, that's hopeless. Yeah, we do it to grow weeds. We don't get enough sun. Although, you know, with, with my experience with plastic culture, we actually planted in the fall. We uh, tried to get, when we could, we would get plug plants. We've also used successfully high elevation plants. We've had better luck planting in fall than we have in the spring. So we would take high elevation as soon as we could get it up, you know, usually early in October. Um, but we had the very best luck planting the plugs in the first or second week of September. Uh, and that worked really, really well for us. So I don't have as much experience with the spring planting. And uh, I, I agree with you. Fall plantings, if I could get my growers to actually do that, it would be great. But and nobody has the time at that time. They're uh, either still harvesting something else or clean up. Uh, and then come October, November, it's too late. So then it's going to be spring. So maybe one more question, if there's some burning questions on the table. When you're planting those in the lake fall like that, are you getting production increase over when you plant in the spring? Yes. Yeah, with Albion, we did. Um, we got more production. It was noticeable that we got, you know, we got a June crop the first year, which we did until we planted in the spring. And we also got a, a larger August, September crop, because the plants were really beautifully established you know, by the time of the first production cycle. So you probably don't have to take flowers off, right, in that system. Uh, when you're doing spring planting, uh, you first want to establish a root system and you want to establish a plant. If you forget to do that, you kind of uh, see the uh, yield no stife and the plant is a, a bonsai. You can sell it as a bonsai, that's about all you can do. Um, you take the first two rounds of flower trusses that come out off, and then you establish a proper plant and then let it go in fruit. And they're surviving through the, the winter like that as a yeah. bare wood at that yeah. size. Mm -hmm. You guys haven't had any problem with them freezing out like no. last year? No. Everybody thinks because they're from a California variety, they should die <coughs> in the winter time. They don't. They don't. They do, they do fine. You talk about planting them in August? September or what? Uh, I've done, well, the, the very best things, the very best results I've had is with plugs first week of September. That was the best for me. Uh, but I've also had great results with high elevation plants, which are a lot more easily available, um, planted early in October. Now, don't plant too early in the year because then you're still going to get the heat and you're going to struggle with that. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, there's an optimum time, which is probably different for you than it is up north for us. Yeah. Tom? I just wanted to, to see if one of the youngers had a comment. I mean, you guys have been developing a, a bed shaper on farm that you were going to commercialize, I think. And I, how, how does the thing that you're developing compare to these on the screen? It's similar. Well, 
not developing it. Brian is. Brian is? Yeah. And which is separate from our farm, just to make that clear. <laughs> is there commercializing it, I guess. <laughs> but we're try trying it. You're trying yeah. okay. it. It's very similar in, uh, to that one on the uh, left side of the screen. Cool. I guess a follow up question to that would then be you know, either in BC or in Washington, you know, what have you. What have you seen the most of? You know, people purchasing uh, directly from either of these suppliers, or are they kind of, you know, throwing things together themselves. Throwing things together themselves. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I see. Maybe not the best <laughs> words, but. <laughs> no, it, it's not very difficult to make one of those yourself. When it comes to the plastic layer, that's usually a different case. There's more pieces. More yeah. more pieces, but uh, it, it's not very difficult. No, no, it's not. If somebody has a workshop anyway that can put this together, it's just fine. Yeah. All right, well, I think we'll uh, take a break right now, 10 or 15 minutes. But thank you to both Hogs.